everybody, this is Arkady Freckman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And today I wanted to go through an opening statement that I just gave a few weeks ago in a jury trial in the Bronx, in New York City, where we ended up settling the case for three and a half million dollars. So this was a case, wasn't the easiest case. It was a slip and fall on snow and ice on the subways, the New York City subway system. And it wasn't inside, but it was rather outside. They have uh, an outdoor train in the Bronx, Van Cortlandt Park. On one side, there's the park. And on the other side, there are stores like Dunkin' Donuts, little uh, deli stores, little, um, you know, little stores, and they have a sidewalk on both sides. So what happens is the train pulls into the station. It's actually the last stop. I believe it's 242nd Street. It's the last stop. The train pulls into the station. People get out, and then there's like a bridge, okay? And then when you walk to one side of the bridge, you have these stairs going this way and going the other way, and you have it on both sides, closer to like the Dunkin' Donuts and the stores, and also on the park side. So our client fell on the park side. And so you have these two stairs. They're all aluminum, you know, metal stairs, steel stairs, and they have a canopy covering them, like a triangular canopy, but they're open on the sides. And in our case, it had snowed, the day before, Sunday, it stopped snowing at night. And Monday morning, he gets off the train, he's going to a doctor's appointment. And as he's, you know, takes that one step, he slips and he falls like all the way down. He falls down many, many of these steps. So how did we do the opening statement? So we started out by thanking the jury. At this point, we had already selected a jury. We had six jurors and two alternates. So we thanked them, we said, thank you. It's very important that you're here. Please listen to the evidence. And you know, in to this day and age, in this time that we live in, do our voices, our thoughts, our beliefs, do they matter? And then I said, look, I know there's one place where I know for sure, where the judge knows for sure, where the attorney that I'm against in this case knows for sure that here, your voices, your thoughts, your beliefs truly matter. So I kind of like empowered the jury in that way. And I think that's important to really focus on the jury because they're the ones that are making the ultimate decision. And then I said, look, you are the only people talking to the jurors. You are the only people, the only human beings who will have the power to make a decision in this case, whether what happened was acceptable, whether it was wrong, and um, whether it's okay to have something like this happen again. And the fact that the Constitution gives us the right for members of the community to make decisions, the right to a jury trial, which is the Seventh Amendment. I didn't say the Seventh Amendment, but, you know, I kind of... Because a lot of people don't want to be in jury duty. You know, they're like, oh, jury duty. Then they want to try to avoid it. So I'm kind of doing the opposite. I'm empowering them. They've, they've all said that they would not mind doing jury duty because they were all selected people who said, look, I, won't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be here. All those people got off in jury selection. So I said, look, this is the last thing we have that's for sure, that's for certain, and is this right of people in the community coming together, talking to each other, making a group decision, and we need you in this case. So then I said, look, brutal honesty, what is this all worth? And I said, I don't want to surprise you. I want to be straight up with you. The amount of money in this case will be $15 million. And I kind of just said it right out there. And I think that's also important to be strong, to be assertive. A lot of lawyers will not mention any monetary amounts in opening statement. In fact, they'll wait till the very end of closing argument. And then they'll say, and I'm going to ask you for $15 million. You know, and then the, the jury's like, what? What are you talking about? They've listened to the trial, maybe it's a week, maybe it's two weeks. And by then they're like, look, I think this is a case worth 500,000. And all of a sudden this guy's up there talking about 15 million and you're never gonna get it that way. So I think a better strategy is to be upfront, to be you know, honest and just front it out there. So I said, look, this is gonna be a $15 million case. And I said it confidently and emphatically. And then look, later on, if they think it's worth less, they can give you less. Um, so, you know, which is what happened. Well, in this case, we ended up settling, which is a little bit of a different animal. We could talk about that later. 
But I think the verdict, it could have been uh, something like that because we had a lot of different elements of damages. We had uh, pain and suffering. We had economic damages like future medical care. So if you put all that together, all of the different elements, when you added it all up, it could be 10 or 15 or even more. It was a, it was a serious injury. So then I, I talked a little bit about what each of the parties knew or did not know. My client, I said, look, my client, uh, he did not know that when it stops snowing, the New York City Transit Authority has to follow a winter operations manual where basically it says, stop all your regular duties, whatever they are, all the employees, all the staff, stop what you're doing, stop all your regular duties and focus on removing the snow. Nothing else matters. And that's a quote that when we took the deposition of one of the certified transit cleaners, that's a quote, a literal verbatim quote that he said, nothing else matters. And I thought that was really good. It's actually also a song by Metallica, but I thought it was really cool. And I, 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 I repeated it. I said, nothing else matters. This is the most important thing. You focus on removing the snow. And then I said, okay, so that's what one thing he didn't know. Another thing my client didn't know is that the transit has supervisors and these supervisors inspect, write down their findings and make sure that all the snow is removed. So they basically look at the steel staircase at everything in the station and they make sure that, you know, this is the manual. It says you have to remove the snow, check to make sure that it's actually done. And if it's not done, hey, wait a minute, there's snow here, then send another cleaning crew, send somebody else. You have a lot of staff and get it done, right? Before the public gets there, before the pedestrians are in danger. And then a third thing that Anthony did not know was that at 1.40 a.m., now remember, it snowed Sunday night, it stopped snowing around like maybe 10 p.m. or so, maybe 11 p.m. So then at 1.40 a.m., 10 cleaners actually show up and they have shovels that they're about to clean. But for whatever reason, by 1.50 a.m., 10 minutes later, all 10 leave because the rail control center reassigns them to go to a different station, to go to, uh, I forget which one, but a different station. So they just all leave and nobody cleans this uh, station. So that's another thing that he could not know. And what he now knows is he needed two major surgeries on his spine and he no longer has a normal human neck, but rather he has a neck with metal because he had to have a fusion, right, with plates and screws put into his neck at multiple levels. Um, and what he also now knows is that he lost the partial use of his left hand, which became a partially paralyzed in the pinky finger area because one of the nerves that runs from the neck goes to the hand. Um, and what he also now knows is that he needed an arthroscopic shoulder surgery and a few other procedures. So basically, I went through the damages this way, that what he now knows is his injuries, but what he didn't know then is what, that they were going to be unsafe. And then I just moved on and I kind of went into who we are suing and why. Some people call this like the teaching section where you explain to the jury. And I said, look, there are three things that they have to be reasonably safe. They have to keep their station reasonably safe for the protection of all people. And if they're not reasonably careful, then they're negligent. And it's a public benefit corporation, right? It's the subway system. So it's for the benefit of the people. And with great power comes great responsibility. And you just have to do these things. So I said, it's a simple thing. There's three R's. Number one, you remove. So it's important that you remove the snow. It's in their own manual, like we talked about. And it's important because people need to be able to get in and get out safely, whether they're getting in, getting on the train or getting off the train and getting to their destination, the bus or their house, whatever, they have to be able to do that safely. Number two, record. You want to record what's happening. When you look at the station, you inspect it, you want to record, is it clean? And if it's not clean, come and clean it. And number three, you want to report. And that's important because a supervisor, when he checks and inspects, they have to make sure that the job was done. And if they don't do it, it can, um, if they don't do it in time, then, you know, people won't be protected. People will be endangered. So, yeah. 
And also record is important. That's almost like the logs that they have. And they did have re really detailed logs. They had logs for everything, who was there, where they were, what they were doing when they took lunch. So I said, it's really important to record because you want to know who is where, you know, when and who did what. So then um, we went back to the defendant's story and I used some quotes like the fact that everything stops and you take care of the snow, nothing else matters. And then another witness said, you make the snow removal reports every time it snows, every time you sign in and out, every move you make, you have to log. And I kind of like that again, because like the other one, nothing else matters. And this one's like every move you make, every breath you take, you have to log. So I used that quote against them again. And I said, look, every move you make, so where, where are the logs? We don't have anything. All we know is 10 people came, they left, they basically said hello and goodbye. And then no, no one else came. And then, you know, 9.30, 10 a.m. is when he fell. So that's pretty much the liability. Then I went into how it happened and I don't wanna you know, go through the whole thing because it was a long opening statement. It probably took about an hour total um, but I went through, you know, the dark, worn edges of the steps of all metal and it kind of took us there. I said, imagine we're here. Imagine we're like a bird on a wire looking down and we're, we're here on that day uh, when it happened. And I kind of went through everything, all the details. And then I did it from plaintiff's story. And I talked about, you know, what he did was reasonable. He got to the staircase. He saw there was snow there. He went back and he told the lady in the token booth, she just said, look, what do you want me to do? She shrugged her shoulders. He came back. There were people behind him. He warned them. He said, please be careful. This is this could be slippery. Put his hand on the handrail. He was wearing Timberland boots. Took one step. But then he didn't know there was ice under the snow. And he slipped. And that's when he went down. And he went down a, a lot of those steps. And then the next thing I did was I kind of undermined the problems, right? When you want to undermine what some people call the warts of the negligence case. Because... We have to show liability. We have to show that my client was not at fault or as little as at fault as possible and that the defendant was as much at fault as possible. So we don't want to like ignore the other side's arguments. So I said, look, one of the things we're going to have to consider is other people didn't fall, right? But what was what is he supposed to do? He's at the mercy of the New York City Transit Authority. He gets off the train. He's not going to stay up there forever. He sees there's snow. He's not the one who's supposed to clean the snow. There's no other way down. The other staircase had snow as well. So what is he going to do? He's going to be able, he's going to have to go down and he was as careful as possible. And, you know, whether someone else fell or not, we don't know. Other people could have fallen. In fact, we had a witness who said that she also slipped and she also saw snow there on prior occasions. So that was one of the things. And then we had to talk about causation and damages and did this fall cause all the injuries? So one of the ways I did that was I said, look, the icy stairs, the steel icy stairs were a substantial factor in causing my client's injuries. Now, why did I say that? Because substantial factor is the same words the judge will use when she reads the jury instructions to the jury right before they issue their verdict, right before they start talking to each other and deciding the case. So that's very, very important. You want to use those words. And it's the law. You don't have to, doesn't have to be the only factor. It just has to be a substantial factor in causing the injuries. So I said, look, he fell and he went to the hospital right away. The hospital found a disc extrusion that same day, the day of the fall. Now it was reconfirmed because they discharged him, but then he was in so much pain. He went to a hospital the next day, the, two days later, he went to the hospital again, different hospital. So I said, look, it was reconfirmed by a different hospital the next day. And this was all on his left side and he fell on his left side. So you have this extrusion in his neck. It was at C6, C7. It was actually measured at 16 millimeters. And then it was reconfirmed the next day. Then after that, he started physical therapy, had pain management. And one of the other issues we had to deal with in this case was the fact that this particular client had a prior neck surgery. So he had a neck surgery five years before, and that was at a different level. That was, I believe, at C4 to C5 and also C5 to C6. And this one was at C6 to C7, right, which is a new level. So I had to explain that, and I also had to do a timeline. So I did an entire timeline, and I showed, look, he had that neck surgery five years ago. He had about a year of treatment. 
It was also a fusion. He had a, um, you know, plate with screws put in you know, through the front back then. But he was he was in his 20s. He was better after that what was over. He finished his physical therapy. He was back to being his normal self. He was active. He was doing things like dancing, you know, exercising. He was actually boxing uh, as a form of exercise. He was just back to living his life. And there's no medical treatment, right? You have this five year, basically, gap in the timeline. There's no medical care. And then all of a sudden, when this happens, the medical care starts again that day, right? And then, boom, 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 boom. We had, like, so many, so much medical treatment. This client had so much medical. I've never seen this much medical treatment for any client, almost. So I said, look, is it just a coincidence? Or using your common sense, is it more likely that this fall is what led to all this medical care. And it was almost like an obvious conclusion. So the timeline was really helpful. So basically we went through um, this entire idea of, um, you know, aggravating and exacerbating a pre-existing condition because he did have the condition before. So if I didn't mention it at all in opening statement, the defense lawyer would get up and would say, oh, Mr. Freckman didn't tell you that this client had a prior surgery at or about the same level, he already had this injury. And then the case would go, <laughs> it would explode, right? So I had to front all that. So I talked about reserves, what you have in reserves, coping, who is more likely to cope with an injury? Is it someone who has no prior injury or maybe somebody who has a vulnerability, a weakness, kind of like an egg that's broken, right? That person, it's harder for them to cope with this injury. So this fall might be the thing that breaks the camel's back or might pushes him over the edge and he can't recover from it the same way as somebody who is perfectly healthy. So I thought that was a good argument too. So basically I was talking about all these issues like coping, reserves, uh, degenerative changes, which is the normal aging process, which is what the defense was going to argue. All of this is just normal aging. And he was only 33 when he got hurt. So uh, there shouldn't be much degeneration in a 33-year-old. Common sense versus coincidence. And then I basically said it's almost like a drip. Is it like a drip, drip, drip? If it's a drip, right, then it would slowly progress over the course of his life. And this is not a drip. This is almost like a cascade. This is a waterfall, like a cascade of symptoms. Boom! It's being hit all on that day when he fell down the stairs. So how could it be? Um, the, the degeneration, that's the normal painless aging process. And then we just go, went through the medicine. We went through some of the hand injuries. Like I mentioned, he was partially paralyzed in his like pinky area because of the, um, you know, because of the, he had like radial neuropathy, some spasticity, uh, finger escape in his pinky. So we talked about things like you can't do like squeezing a lime or, you know, buttoning a button, something as simple as like buttoning a button, you know, but buttoning and unbuttoning, it takes some dexterity in your fingers. And we talked about how I showed them like images, 3D MRIs, as well as images that show the dermatones. So there's like the C7 T1, which is the final disc in the neck and the first disc in the mid back, which is the thoracic, the neck is the cervical. So C7 is the final neck disc, the cervical, and T1 is the first thoracic disc, the mid-back, the middle back. And there's 12 discs in the mid-back, there's seven in the uh, neck. So I said, look, that's the, that's the disc, that's the, the disc where the nerve from that disc travels, that's called a C8 nerve root. It travels actually right here to your ring finger and your um, pinky on your left hand. And that's where he was injured. So it was really, I thought it was good in terms of explaining exactly the medicine and exactly how it works uh, specifically. And then he had some other injuries, like he needed a shoulder arthroscopic, but that was kind of like, you know, much smaller than, you know, just arthroscopic by itself is worth like 100,000, maybe 200,000. It's worth much less. So I kind of downplayed that. I focused on the, the cervical issues, which could lead to myelopathy and things like that. Um, he also had some mental health issues, you know, depression after this was a serious injury. So I talked about that, I talked about the things he can and cannot do, went through like a few of the witnesses, like I had witnesses like uh, his relationship with his uh, nephew, 
who was uh, nonverbal but high functioning and the things they used to do. So I went through like the human story. I don't want to go through all of that again, but I'll, and I went through, oh, a friend of his that was really close to him that was almost like a mother, motherly figure to him that taught him how to dance when he was like 16 because he did a lot of salsa and merengue type dancing. And then, um, you know, her, what she was going to testify. These are all witnesses that were going to testify. We had 15 witnesses in this case altogether. So we talked about his pre-injury life. Or we talked about what the jury could do about it. And uh, then we went through the medicine. Um, and we told some stories. Like, for example, one time he was in the uh, grocery store and he wanted to do something nice for his girlfriend. He wanted to buy uh, spaghetti and, and sauce because he thought, okay, I'm going to cook dinner. He wants to still do things. He doesn't want to be a burden to others, which is, you know, like everybody. He doesn't want to be a burden. He wants to be a resource. He wants to be a help. He wants to be, he has to be like the man of the of the relationship, right? He has a long-term girlfriend. So he bought this pasta. He's carrying the bag. He just paid for it. And then because of the hand issues, he drops the bag and the pasta sauce, the glass just shatters. And there's pasta sauce everywhere. And then they say, you know, clean up, please come. And people start coming and just embarrassing for him. And so I told it in a lot of detail to really explain that. And then some of the things that he used to do before that he couldn't do after. So, yeah, so that was basically the opening statement. I thought, you know, overall it went well. Um, there was a lot of facts in this case. It was really fact intensive. So maybe it was a little bit too many facts, too many like medicine and, you know, stories where I could have maybe cut it down, but still made the same points. So maybe next time I would work on that. Um, also, I felt like it was good, but maybe I could even make it better. And that's what we're always doing, right? That's why they call it the practice of law, because you're always trying to improve, always trying to make it better. So I hope this was helpful. Let us know what questions you have, but this was the case. And then after the opening statement, the defense gave their opening. Then we put on the first witness and the first witness was actually the eyewitness that saw how he fell. And then after that, we were about to question the transit authority worker, the one who mentioned about nothing else matters. But right when that happened, the transit authority called their supervisors and they started talking negotiations and they came up with three and a half million dollars. And at that point, the client said, look, I would accept that because that's guaranteed money. The major reason was if we had done this trial, it would take like maybe maybe three, four more weeks. The trial would not, this trial ended in July. And if we didn't settle, it would probably go until at least August 11th, maybe even into this week, which is the week of August. You know, this week would be over August 18th. It might be, and we could actually, we couldn't go into August 18th because the judge was going to close the court. She was going on vacation, but we had so many witnesses. It was just a really comprehensive case. So so it was good that we settled it because even if we had done the whole trial and then we took a higher verdict, let's say the jury said six million, seven million, the transit authority would have appealed. The appeal would take three or four years. And then we're pretty sure, like based on, you know, looking at other cases, the appellate division would most likely say, look, you know, 10 million or whatever we got, eight million, nine million, it's too high. Take less, take like four. So then we're pretty much at the same thing now, right? Three, three and a half. And we don't have to wait five years you know, and, and, and have to jump through all these hurdles. Because number one, we have to win the case. We have to get 10 million, which isn't easy. Number two, we have to um, see what the appellate division does on the appeal. And that's going to take another, you know, three, four years. And then when, if they say, look, it's too high, take, you know, three, then we're back to where we started from. And then they might say, you know what, go try the case again. And you don't want to try a case like this again. We had over $100,000 in expenses, just out-of-pocket expenses, like paying doctors. You know, this is a very, very comprehensive case. So I hope this was helpful. Let us know what questions you have. We are here for you. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what video topics you want to hear about. And we will uh, prepare because we're doing some new videos right now, uh, outlining and coming up with new um, ideas so we could be um, giving you the content that you want. Okay, everyone, have a great day. We are here for you. And uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye.